Praise God. Good morning, church. Three more weeks to go until we gather together. Really looking forward to it. We need to encourage one another to come to church. I've been meditating upon our lockdown, what we have got used to. And it's amazing how much we do get used to and how easy that humanity adapts. But we need to understand that it's important to gather together. I know that some of you are really looking forward to come back to church and yet others are struggling at the thought of assembling ourselves together. And the world would have us isolate forever. But we need to know that God calls us to come together as a church, come together as a body, come together as a family. Because we know that we encourage one another. Let's prepare our service this morning by reading Hebrews 13 verse 15. It says, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. When I prepare our hearts now for praise, spiritual warfare, that's what praise actually is. And it was a continual responsibility of the Levitical priesthood to come together every morning, every evening and offer praise to God. In, in that's actually found in 1 Chronicles 23:30, and David also organized the Levites in their duties to praise, to serve as priests. Praise is so important. So we need to bring ourselves present wherever we are today, wherever we are gathered, whoever we are watching and, and uniting with, watching with, I should say, and uniting with, we need to turn our eyes to Jesus. New beginning, new day today, so that we can praise God. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you indeed that this is the day that you have made. That we can forget what lies behind. That we can lift up our eyes. That we can unite with heaven this morning. I thank you for breath. I thank you for life. I thank you for long suffering. I thank you for kindness. I thank you that you are with us at all times. That we cannot escape or flee from your presence. I thank you for my beloved church. As we unite our hearts this morning, oh Father God, we look forward to the day that we assemble ourselves together, that there'll be great rejoicing in our midst, Lord. For the times that have gone, these last months that we have been apart, I thank you for your, your faithfulness, Lord, that you've never left us nor forsaken us. Again, we thank you for Archbishop's life, in season and out of season. He is ready to preach your word in power. Oh, hallelujah. We just invite your Holy Spirit. Without you, Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. I thank you for answered prayer this week. Again, Lord, I thank you, God, that when we call upon you in the day of trouble, you always deliver. And we give you glory. And we testify of your goodness. I want to thank God today. For Angela's neighbor, I just want to share with the church, Angela actually texted me this week and brought to our attention about her neighbor who, who was diagnosed, young, young man actually, with a family, and he was diagnosed with cancer. We had the best case scenario this week to answer prayer, so I just want to thank God. I always thank God for what he does, because when we pray and we pray in faith, God answers prayer. Prayer is so important. So don't stop praying. Don't stop petitioning God. Be like that widow. Just keep on praying. Keep on pushing. Keep on climbing. God never changes. And I read something as well before I hand over. We're blessed this morning. We're going to have Dominic and Shenis ministering in worship. But I read this article, this post, I should say, that spoke to me this week. And it said, if you are more fortunate than others... Build a longer table, not a taller fence. And that's the opposite to what the world is teaching us now. In isolation, in congregating with just that immediate. If you are more fortunate than others, build a longer table. Let's be more hospitable, not less. But of course, being wise. But don't, I'm speaking about what's happening spiritually, not so much physically. Because yes, we need to be wise and be be conscious and be our brother and sister's keeper, but don't allow the enemy's devices to enter into your heart and to make you isolate spiritually. If you're more fortunate than others, build a longer table, not a taller fence. I'm going to pass over to Dominic 
and to share this to lead us in worship. Be blessed. You are blessed and highly favoured. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Penny, for them words. It's, it's important now that we come before God to, to lift up praise and worship and to prepare the way for the word this morning so that the word can go out in power and can break up the fallow, the, um, the fallow ground within our lives that the Lord will give us new seeds that can be deposited into our hearts this morning so that the word may germinate and become fruit. We just want to give him the praise and the glory. We're going, to, we're going to lift up this morning and declare who you say I am. And it's not important about what other people are saying about who you are. It's what God says who you are this morning. So we're going to lift up and we're going to, we're going to declare that this morning. Um, yes, amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was a lost bird, he bought me in all oh, his love for me. In oh, all his love for me. In the sunset spring, oh, it's spring deep. I'm a child. against me and I am who you say I am and we need to declare that and take that on board this morning that we are a, that we are chosen we are a chosen generation and we need to really cherish that that that, everything that, that God gave us and and did for us and we need to give him thanks continually we're gonna lift up a song now called strong God he's a father to the fatherless the defender of the weak the freedom for the prisoner we sing this is God in his holy place this is God clothed with love and strength amen Oh 
lead us in the wilderness, faithful to the Lord.
the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. of the word. We're going to take our offering as it's mentioned time in and time again. It's important. This is a part of our worship, our praise. So be blessed as you give. God bless you. Thank you. 
beautiful words. Because you still reign, you are God. Amen. Amazing. Just give him the praise and glory. We want to thank him for everything that he does for us. For giving us the ability to come together this morning in, in this way. To, to lift up praise and worship and to prepare our hearts to hear your word this morning, Lord God. We want to thank you, Lord, for the offering that's been collected this morning. We ask that you just, uh, just bless every single person that's given. That you'll meet their, their needs, Lord God. And that, Father God, you'll give us the wisdom and the discernment, Lord God, how to use these funds to extend your kingdom. We give you the thanks and the praise. And we ask for that right now as we prepare our hearts to hear your word. And you just bless our Archbishop, Lord God. Cover him, protect him, Lord God. May your angels be, be around him, Lord God. Envelope him, Lord God. That as he speaks your word, your word will come out like fire, Lord God. And will burn with the chaff within our lives, Lord God. We give you the praise, the glory, and the worship. As we say it together, amen, amen, amen. As I invite Archbishop to share the word this morning. God bless you. Welcome this wonderful, sunny Sunday morning. Praise Lord. I pray you're all awake, anticipating the move of the Spirit as he's already been moving through worship, through praise. Thanks to the senior pastor, the worship team, and everyone involved in allowing this transmission to be transmitted to your homes this morning. God bless you. Amen. I pray we're going to take some spiritual exercise this morning as we wake up and really live and rejoice with what God is doing because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. Praise God. Today we're looking at a portion of the Gospel of John, of, sorry, the Gospel of Luke chapter 4 and we're looking at uh, relating to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So I want to take it slowly to begin with and let the Holy Spirit take the momentum. So we're going to read Luke chapter 4 verse 16 to verse 22. Be open because we want to do spiritual exercise today. I want to wake up in the power of the Holy Spirit, praise God. This is um, Luke 4, verse 16, reads as follows. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. He has set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Praise the Lord. Thank God for the word. On Friday, we were actually looking at, through the gospel of the, the, the book of Isaiah. And we, were looking, we, we drew a phrase out, a statement that as I was making was repeated quite often in the book of Isaiah. And we were looking at, just take one of the examples, Isaiah chapter 3 verse 7. It says, in that day. And the Greek, and I quoted from the Greek, the imera ekin, in that day. And Isaiah was looking forward to see, or oh, the coming of the day of the Lord. He saw it in the spirit. But... At the time when Jesus came, the reality of everything that the prophets were anticipating, were expecting, was fulfilled through the life of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And our Lord qualifies this by quoting from the book of Isaiah and validating Isaiah as a true prophet of God. Because he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And what are the implications about this scripture being fulfilled in the hearing of those who were in the audience in the synagogue on that Sabbath day? The implications are this, that everything that's written in relation to the Spirit of God become a fulfillment. What the Lord is saying is those who are captive can be liberated and will be liberated. We've need, we're liberated, God gives us the, 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 the way to be liberated, but if it becomes to become a reality in our lives, we have to embrace it and act upon it. You know, I can give you a guide, I can give you a map to get to a certain destination, unless you make the effort to get out and take the course that, which that map, map outlines, you're still gonna be in the same place. 
And today the Word of God is the map for us to come into the presence of God. These words are there to help us facilitate our presence and our connection with heaven, with the presence of the Holy Spirit, of the, of the anointing of the Lord. So praise the Lord. Now I want to just look at a few of these verses, look at them, reflect on them, and try and draw the deeper significance and understanding of what the prophet Isaiah is saying and what Jesus is quoting and being fulfilled in his life. I, I pray you're with me as we take this journey together. The portion of scripture that uh, Jesus was given was Isaiah chapter 61. And in verse 1, it reads as follows. It's quoting from Isaiah chapter 6. So I'm going to do some scholastic exercise first. Then we're going to come to the spiritual implications, what these passages mean for us. Isaiah 61 verse 1 says, says this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound. It's a powerful statement, and it's, it becomes even more powerful when it's quoted by our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ himself, who gave it to Isaiah the prophet in the first place, in the spirit, and that he says you know, it is actually being fulfilled. As he reads it, it has become fulfilled. It's fulfilled in the presence of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. When Jesus manifests freedom, we are emancipated, we become free. And on Friday I was saying we need to re return to our spiritual center to look at the world through the, through the lens of the Spirit, to look at through the world through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, through the eyes of the Lord Himself, through the mind of Jesus Christ, praise God. Interestingly, the Isaiah chapter 61, where it says the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, uh, when Luke quotes this passage of Scripture, it's word for word quoted as is Isaiah in the Greek, in the Greek, Isaiah 61 verse 1, for it's exactly word for word quoted. So the implication is clear, the syntax is the same. If, the, if, if, if Luke was quoting, because Luke was a Greek physician, and they were using the Greek manuscripts, the Greek parchments, to quote from the Old Testament, because Luke... Paul and the apostles were using Greek at that time, quoting the Old Testament scripture. It wasn't the Hebrew text. And I would just qualify this. Let's do a bit of spiritual um, uh, an analysis of, of the word of God, uh, textual criticism, if you like. Uh, so I want to take up Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. And you can join me here. I mean, this may go a bit deep, maybe go over your heads, but I pray you, you're excited. You, you, you research yourself the word of God. Just to qualify a few things here before I move forward, just to show that they are quoting from the Greek text, not from the Hebrew text. Because it's word for word quoted the same. It's a mirror. It's a mirror between Isaiah and Luke. And I just want to quote this. Isaiah 61 verse 1. If we just go up to the Greek. Verse 1, it says this. Bnev makirio evemo. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. If we go to Luke chapter 4 verse 18 in the Greek. If you, choose, you can remember, cross-reference it yourself. If we go to the book, it says, Bnev Makirio Ebemo, exactly the same phrase. Then he goes, carries on. Let me just catch that in Luke for a second. He says, Emet Mu, O, O, Inigem, Echrisen, Me Evangelisaste, Tochis. He has anointed me to preach the gospel, preach the good tidings to the poor. If we go to the the, the Greek of Isaiah, which is a Septuagint, which was written 300, approximately 300 years BC during the conquest of Alexander the Great when he invaded those areas and the, the Jews became Hellenized in Alexandria and they translated the Hebrew to the Greek. And that's the Greek that the apostles are using. This is what it says in Isaiah. It says this, the second phrase, it says, and it says, inigen exactly the same phrase as the Greek. So I just want to leave it there. It's too much to go through word for word, uh, punctuation by punctuation. But I just show that that's where Luke is taking uh, his translation from and quoting it, praise the Lord. And in fact, Luke was a Greek physician. And his Greek, the, the Gospel of Luke's Greek, is one of the most, the best forms of Greek of its day. Amen. As opposed to, the Gospel of John, which is quite simplified. But let me just move away from that, from textual, textual criticism at the moment, and come back to our passage today. So Jesus goes on to say, in the light of the anointing coming upon him, the Spirit of the Lord being upon him, he says that this, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. 
What is he saying? He's saying all the benefits of the anointing have been manifest to us here. All the benefits. So whatever is connected to the blessings that are connected and relate to God, they are being fulfilled through his ministry. Praise the Lord. So when we have the anointing of the Lord upon our lives, all the benefits which are embodied in the Holy Spirit should be our portion. We should be, we should be blessed through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And not only, it does not stay with us, it's not just a subjective thing, but it becomes an objective thing, meaning that when we're blessed, other people around our lives have the opportunity, equally so, to be blessed as we are blessed. I want to qualify what I mean by this, because it says when the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, people around us will be blessed by virtue of the fact that we've allowed God to operate and move in and through our lives. The evidence of the Spirit upon our lives is our actions and, the, and our outlook and our behaviour changes when the anointing of the Lord is upon our lives, praise God. See, I just want to just move on from here because this is quite, I want to take it quietly, but I'm sensitive to where everyone is who's watching this, this transmission at this moment. So there's a number of things that benefit. There's a number of things that people benefit through the anointing being upon your life. See, because when you have the anointing, it's not a selfish thing. It's not something that we keep to ourselves and we do not share. The more we allow the anointing and the gift in our lives to flow out of our lives and impact other people, the more blessed we are. The more we give, the more we have left over. The less we give, the less we have in ourselves. It's the law, it's the, it's the law of contradiction, if you like. The, the, the diminish, increase. The more we give out, the more we have left over. When you give the five loaves and two fish, you have 12 baskets left over. So you've got more when you finish than what you started with. So when anointing comes upon our lives, when we share it around, freely, not, not being selfish, we are blessing ourselves as equally as where other people are being blessed by virtue of our relationship with God. Your relationship with God must be a blessing unto someone else today. So because you are blessed, other people, they must be blessed by being in your presence, praise God. So a number of things happen as a result of that anointing being upon your life. And the anointing being upon your life is not a kind of thing that self-gratification, self-absorbed, it's me, 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 myself and I, it's about giving outwardly, praise God. He didn't say the anointing of the Lord is upon, upon me and the, God, the Lord has blessed me to become self-independent in myself. He's blessed me so other people can be blessed because of my blessing. I'm emphasizing this and repeating this because sometimes we lose sight of what our responsibility unto others when we are blessed. It's not just we cannot contain the blessing. The blessing is too big for us to contain in our, limited, in our limited self. It's like taking the ocean and trying to contain all that ocean in a little cup. You cannot do this. So you cannot take all that anointing and just have it selfishly to yourself. You've got to let it flow. And as it flows, you're blessed and other people are blessed by virtue of your selflessness. As you're giving out, that you're giving yourself to God. And in turn, God in you will bless other people. Watch what These are the benefits of that anointing. We read it often time, but I want you to just embrace it, just think about, reflect this and really uh, get to understand what this actually means for, not just for you, for the people around you. Because you're here to enrich the world. You're not here just to be a sideshow, you're there to highlight the king of glory in this world, praise God. He says this, he has, he has, he, the Lord uh, is upon me, to preach the gospel, he says, uh, me to preach the gospel to, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And it, it's about not just being poor mater in material terms, it's about the, the spiritual uh, poverty that people encounter. People are poor spiritually. They want the gospel, the richness of the gospel to, to quench their, 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 their dryness, their emptiness, their barrenness of their lives, to, to quicken their spirits, praise the Lord. And not only goes beyond this and he says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. The problem is with our generation, we're doom and gloom generation. We don't heal broken heart, we don't heal broken hearts, we actually break hearts. We, we, more, we destroy rather than build in our attitude. Our, um, our indifference, our, our procrastination, our, our lack of vision is breaking people's hearts, is damaging rather than doing good. We need to get up. And the, and the best way to heal someone's heart is to allow your heart to be healed in the, in the first place. As the prophets were saying, God is taking the stony heart of our lives and giving us a heart of flesh. He's giving us a new heart. He's given us a new mind. He's given us a new being, a new identity. Well, he's restoring the identity that he intended from the beginning for the coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To proclaim liberty to the captives. 
Amen. There are people imprisoned by external forces, but many oftentimes internal forces. And God wants to liberate us from the captivity. Being captives of our limitations, being captives of our fear, being captives through our insecurities, being captives of the past, being captives of, of opinion, how people see us, being prisoners of people's thoughts about us, people's attitudes towards us. We need to be liberated. We need to be set free. Praise the Lord. Because if the sun sets you free, you are truly free indeed. And recover your sight to the blind. You know, we're walking around, we think we can see. But unless we look out and see through the eyes of Christ, we're blinded. We were limited in our outlook. When we look out and we just see, we do not have any hope. We don't have, we don't see a way forward. We are blinded. You know, when God opens our spiritual eyes, our limitations become unlimited. Our natural becomes supernatural. There's things we'll be able to achieve and accomplish beyond our wildest imagination. When we start believing and trusting in God, praise God. There was a time in my life that I was blind. I was deaf. I was dumb. I couldn't speak because... The best way to speak is to speak the love of God. If you speak anything else, if you speak profanities of the world and, and speak the negativity of the world, you're not really speaking, you're dumb. You're, you're ignorant. We need to speak beyond those limits. We need to break out of that straitjacket of limitation that the world conditions us or, or places upon us or limits us with and through, praise God. Amen. So we need to look out and see clearly. The rain has gone. It's a clear day now. We need to look out through the eyes of hope. And look at the opportunities God is presenting to each one of us. Praise God. Amen. There was a time I was blind. I couldn't see. I didn't, I didn't have any hope or any expectation for my life. It was a dead end. But God opened, made a door where there was no way. There was made a way where there was no way. And opened a door that no one can close. All the negative naysayers around my life, God shut their mouth. And he, he was speaking to me words of encouragement, words of hope, words of opportunity, words of potential that what I can achieve if I trust myself to him. That's why Paul says, I can do all things. Not just some, but I can do all things for Christ who strengthens me. Through so many things we've achieved as a, as, as a body, as a church, as, a, as individuals, so many qualifications. We don't receive the qualifications to show of how wonderful we are. We receive them to open doors for us that we can be a blessing, we can be useful for other people, for the world, to benefit and move forward, praise God. So recovery of sight to the blind, recovery of sight to the blind. Adam saw, but when he looked at with Eve at the fruit and it was desirable, food for, for food was desirable, their spiritual eyes, when they took of that fruit, their spiritual eyes were closed and their physical eyes were open. And God is restoring the years that the locusts have eaten. God is restoring our spiritual sight that we can see clearly, that we can see. We don't see enemies. We see opportunity. We see potential. And we don't see haters. We see co-workers. You see, Paul was a hater of the church. Paul was someone who was persecuting the church, was sentencing people to death. But God had a purpose, a plan for his, for his life. When he, when he sent him to the street called Straight to encounter Ananias, one of the disciples, Ananias didn't understand the mechanisms of God. He says, this is this plan, he's persecuting the church. He says, maybe he was, but he's not going to be. It's not what he was, it's what I'm going to make of him that makes the difference. So I'm going to change the way he looks. So I blind him physically that he can see spiritually. Place God. So God is opening this, giving sight to the blind, opening our blindness to see clearly, to see what God has for us and for you praise God hallelujah even I uh, just for a little detail before I carry on with the passage of the anointing Zacchaeus he wanted to see Jesus he was limited that in Luke chapter 19 when we was read of Zacchaeus he was a man of short of stature he couldn't see Jesus because of the crowds but something amazing he may have not seen Jesus but he saw something else which would become beneficial to him because his eyes were open he saw the potential he saw something that could help him to see Jesus. He saw the sycamore tree, praise God. And maybe you may not have a direct vision to Christ now, but you, have a, a, you can see something that will help you get to Jesus. Maybe it might be a friend. Maybe it might be the word. Maybe it might be something else, a situation in your life. That might be the thing that facilitates and helps you to get a clearer vision of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The, the important thing is we have to desire it in the first place. If the case didn't desire it, he'll still be behind the crowds. He'll be still where he was, 
But the fact that he saw the sycamore tree, he may not see Jesus, but he saw the next best thing to get him to Jesus and was the sycamore tree. So look out, watch this space and see what can be beneficial for you that you can see Jesus. And I can tell you something that Jesus will see you. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. So then he goes on to say in Luke chapter, uh, sorry, in Isaiah chapter um, uh, 61 and Luke chapter 18, so forth, he says, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. There are many things that oppress us and you can fill the, the gaps yourself. What is the thing that might be oppressing you or might be oppressing someone you love or someone around you? It might be an ailment, it might be a situation, it might be a circumstance, it might be financial restraint, it might be all sorts of things. But let me tell you something, when you come to the Lord, your outlook at these same situations will be different. You will not be looking at them as problems, but you'll be looking at them as stepping stones to get you somewhere closer where God wants you to be, praise God. So every setup, I said on Friday, is a set, every setback is a setup for something greater that God wants to do in and through your life. And then he goes, concludes by saying, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now this is the day the Lord has made that we're rejoicing and we're glad in it. And Jesus said, this scripture is fulfilled in their hearing. So if it was fulfilled approximately 2,000 years ago, it's a continuation of that fulfillment. It's fulfilled today and even more so because at the time when Jesus quoted Isaiah, the Holy Spirit had not been given up unto that point. The anointing to the, the, the believers, the, the people of God, the ones who accepted Jesus. Now we have the anointing. Now we stand in the place of Jesus Christ. Now we are the anointed. And being an anointed of the Lord, God puts a safeguard, a safety net around you, a hedge around you, fortifies you to protect you. And what is that protection we have? Is Jesus Christ himself the high priest. I wish I'm speaking to someone. He says, put on Christ and make no provision for the flesh. You put on Christ, you put on the fortification of God. He's the strong tower that the righteous run in and they are safe. Oh, I praise God. I wish, I wish you're receiving because you're empowered. You're special people. God really is blessing you and, 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 and he wants to protect you. That's why the psalmist tells us that God comes against those who come against his anointing. As I, uh, sorry, Psalm 105 verse 15 says this, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. God gives a word. God puts the world and the spiritual realm at notice and says, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. You have been, a bit, by virtue of the fact that we call ourselves Christian, being a Christian means you're chrismated, you are anointed. But at the time when Jesus was ministering and after the resurrection, the first believers was called the Nazarenes, the ones who followed the, Jesus Christ. Or they were called the ones on the way. But it, it was coined, the word Christian was coined in Antioch. The first Christians were named in Antioch, meaning the ones who were chrismated, the ones who were anointed. And the same anointing that was on Jesus Christ must be upon his followers, his people, his children, his disciples. His anointing is passed on to us, praise God, because he said, greater works you will do than I have done, he said, tells us in the Gospel of John. So it means that we stand in his place, that we're anointed. If Jesus opens the, the, the eyes of the blind, helps set up liberty those who are captives, it, 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 all, these, all these benefits, of what come, which come with the anointing, if Jesus fulfills them in his life and we're, and we're his representatives, his ambassadors and his stewards in this world, therefore that must be the outcome of people around our lives, must be beneficiaries of these blessings. If you're in a place and people are still in darkness, you've got to question your position with God. If you are the light of the world, darkness and light cannot co-inhabit together apart from the mysteries of God because there is a divine contradiction because God inhabits the darkness of ignorance. But if you are in God and Christ is in you and his light is illuminated, shining through you, it has to disperse the darkness of what's happening around the world. You've got to give hope in hopeless situations. You've got to give peace where there's trouble. You've got to change people's outlook by your presence must change things. Your presence must improve people's lives, not Make it worse, make it better. No. If you're going to places and you're creating conflict and confusion, you've got to question your place, your position with God. Oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And so the benefits of the anointing, when the anointing comes, something happens first personally to us, 
Then we can pass on our benefits to other people because you're, you're getting a medicine. Just imagine if, this, if there was a, a miraculous medicine, which there is a miraculous medicine, which is the presence of God. But let's just say in the world, if there is a med medicine that can cure every disease, and it was a small tablet, and you had the formula, you know what the world will do? The world will, will, um, will, 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 will produce it and benefit material from it. The world will copyright it. Yeah? The world will, will cover it, protect it, and keep the formula secret. Like you see these big corporations that have certain formulas, restaurant formulas, and they, they keep them secret. No one knows the ingredients of some of the things that you buy, you buy every day because it's a secret, because they're making money out of this. But when God gives you a secret, he wants you to share that secret to the world. He wants you to climb on the roof to and share the healing, the love, the benefits of having God in your life, praise God. Hallelujah. So if you have this miraculous medicine that can heal all ailments, all sicknesses, are you going to, as a man or woman of God, keep it? No, you will not. I don't believe you can do that. That's why we share the word of God. That's why I don't hold back in sharing the things of God, the promises of God, the blessings of God, because I know they've been, I know they can change people's lives, not temporally, but forever, because we're passing through, praise God. It's not how, it's not just what we do here. What we do here sets us up for eternity. We're past, we make the best of what we're here. We rejoice while we're here, but we're passing on. Like a child is in its, womb, in its mother's womb for nine months. It's passing, it's going to pass through the mother's womb to a new dimension. We are here for a period of time. Whatever the womb of the world period is for each person, it differs for every person. But we are passing through. Be not get to the position that when you pass through, you're going to enjoy the eternity of God, of what you benefited here in this world. Oh, there's so much I can say about that subject, but let, let's, that will suffice for the moment. But so the anointing does something amazingly to begin with. When the anointing comes upon you, it breaks the, it breaks the stronghold of the enemy. Let me tell you something. If you don't know there's a stronghold of the enemy, I'm telling you something. From my over 30 years of ecclesiastical experience, there is spiritual strongholds holding people down, limiting people, destroying people's lives. There's witchcraft. There's voodoo. There's all things. I'm telling you that these are real, these are real demons that fly around and keep people in bondage, hostages and in prison and these are the things that the Lord is breaking the stronghold of people's lives through the anointing, praise God that's why when the Lord crossed over the Sea of Galilee and came to Gadarines, the man was demon possessed he was, he was, there was a stronghold in his life and the Lord broke that stronghold because when Jesus stepped on the shore of his life the demons were tormented by the presence of the Lord. And when anointing comes in your life, you'll be a torment to the demonic powers around you. I wish I was speaking. I'm just trying to drop this into your spirit to encourage you to know who you are in God and who God is to you. Praise God. You are more than a conqueror. You're not just a conqueror. You are more because he's, 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 he's established the victory for you. You're walking in the victory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the first thing that goes is the power of the oppressor. The strongholds have to come down. When the anointing comes, the enemy cannot stand. He has to flee. I wish I'm speaking to someone. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27 says this. It should come to pass in that day. What did we say? The Imera Ekini. In that day. And this is the day now the Lord has made. And we are rejoicing and we are glad. And he says, in that day. He says that he, his burden will be taken away from your shoulder. About to break strongholds. And his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. The anointing will break the yoke. Well, he says, he says, over oh, oh, from your shoulder, his yoke from your neck. We're bound. And, and God, when anointing comes, he strikes the stronghold of the enemy and breaks those shackles, breaks those fetters, breaks those chains. He breaks and sets the captive free. That's what this is about. And because you've been set free, you can help set other people free. You can open the prison gate, but people have to walk out of that prison themselves. Sometimes people make their prisons comfortable. They decorate them. They furnish their prisons. Sometimes it's like a prison. They make it all nice, appealing, comfortable. And they don't want to come out of that comfort because the prison wouldn't feed them. They don't have to do it for themselves. They get a more sweat day. It's like the Egyptian, the Israelites, they left Egypt and they were criticizing uh, Moses because they, in the wilderness, they had to do it for themselves. In Egypt, they were given the food to eat. In the wilderness, they have to go and fend for themselves. Sometimes we don't want to do it for, we want other people to do it for us. But there's a power, there's a peace, there's a joy of being self-sufficient in God. 
Praise the Lord. See, the anointing does, a, does amazing things. The anointing helps us focus. When the anointing comes, our outlook will change. Your eye, the way you see the world will be different, praise God. There won't be a problem that will overpower you. You will always over, overcome whatever challenge. You will overcome the challenges. The first epistle of John chapter 2 verse 19 says this. This is because if you don't have that anointing, and if you don't allow the anointing to be established in your life, when the going gets tough, you're going to get going. You cannot remain in the purpose of God if you don't let, allow that anointing to be established in your life. You cannot stay in the purpose of God. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. Bishop, Archbishop, Patriarch, Deacon, uh, Steward, what Choir, uh, whatever you call yourself, it doesn't matter. If you don't allow that anointing to be established, when the going gets tough, you are going to be running for the hills. You're not going to be seen for dust. It's the anointing that keeps you stable, keep you in stability, to carry on moving, persevering, in spite and not because. This is what the, uh, John tells us in his epistle. First epistle of John chapter 2. Verse 19 says this, they went out from us, watch this. Now you see people, you think people leave your churches and leave churches, this is not anything new. It happened back in the day and it's going to happen today. It's going to happen, happen until the Lord comes back in glory to take us to be with him forever. It's going to happen, people will fall away. But your allegiance is not to the people fall away, your allegiance is to God himself. You serve God. Not because of who's around you. You serve God because of who's within you. I wish I'm speaking to get that later on. Praise the God. They went out from us, but they were not of us. You can be in here, but you may not be of us. Being somewhere geographically me, does not mean you consent. That you are there geographically for the right reasons. Praise God. He says, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, watch this, they would have continued with us. Now this is the Apostle John. This is the one who leaned on the breast of Jesus. Can you, can you imagine he had people around him in his church, in his midst, that were with him for a time and left and abandoned him. And he was a miracle worker. Can you imagine? So you think people today fall away, detached, 2,000 so years, detached from the resurrection, from the church life, and you think that this is anything new? No, it's not. Do not become a victim of other people's uh, evil and other people's misplaced uh, values and other people's ignorance. Do not become that victim. Separate yourself. You're not serving God because of Joe Bloggs, Tom, Dick or Harry. You're serving God because you have a relation with the master himself, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You're following the Lord, not because of anyone else around, but because you want to serve your purpose in God. Let me just qualify this very quickly. They would have committed, continued with us, but they went out. That they might be made manifest. God allows it to expose who's for him and who's against him. I've seen many people, whether deacons, whether pastors, come and go. But I've seen the word of God abides forever, praise God. Watch this. That none of them were, were of us. It was clear to show, expose them. God will put you in a place to show you where your allegiance is. Is it for him? Or is it for yourself? Or is it for, some, for someone else? I've seen people, the mighty fool. When, 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 when uh, Saul was made king, he became jealous and envious of David. The mighty, when he died with Jonathan, his son, Jesus, um, um, David uh, did a homage for him. He says, the mighty have fallen. The mighty fall. Unless you're establishing God, you will fall. You need God. You will fall and you will be a fool. God, it's God who establishes us. Praise God. Even the mighty angels, the cherub, the anointed cherub, had fallen. Because he felt more important of himself, more about himself than he thought about his Lord and his mate. I wish I'm speaking to someone. Humility is the order of the day. Watch what John goes on to say in verse 20. But you, he differentiates those who didn't allow the anointing to be established in life with those who did. He says, but you, he says, right into the churches, but you have an anointing of the Holy One and you know all things. Oh, I wish I'm speaking to someone. It's powerful. He says, I, I, wanted you, I want you to just please grasp what he's saying, John is saying. This is the beloved disciple. This is the one who was exiled in Batmos. This is the one who wrote the book of Revelation. He makes this statement and he writes this statement who the Lord appears and told him last time, end time prophecies, what will happen? You've got to take his words, he says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things, meaning the anointing will bring understanding. That's why Jesus says, many things I have to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you and he will lead you into all truth. It's the anointing 
that gives us understanding. It's anointing that helps us persevere on the road. It's anointing that helps us become uh, tenacious in our serving of God. Allow that anointing to be established in you. Don't be concerned the people's opinion or views about you and your walk. Do not hear naysayers or, or say you're fanatic or this. You look through the eyes of the Spirit and you see what difference that will make in your life and also the people around you. God will have that breakthrough when you allow him to have the breakthrough and enter your life in the right way and let it become established in your life. Watch this, watch. He says, he says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. He says, que imis chrisma echede apotu ayu que irate panda. I want you to do a bit of Greek exercise. Let's just read this together in Greek. Uh, repeat after me. So you can read, the, you, so you can at least say you're going to service and you actually heard proper Greek New Testament. Praise God. Because when I hear the Erasmus translation of Greek, it's, that, it, it's damaged the language. That's not how the Greek spoke. People want to challenge that, that's up to you. We want to hold on to that, that's up to you. But let's just read it how it should be read. Because the New Testament Greek, Cyprus dialect is exactly the same as New Testament Greek. Because of that diaspora, when the Jews left, left, left Israel, they settled in Cyprus. And many of them were Greek speaking. In fact, as we know the tradition, Lazarus was the first bishop of Cyprus. And when, 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 um, when, when, when John wrote the gospel, he wrote it in the Greek dialect, the Cypriot dialect, I should say. La lo, la lis, la alas, and all, and all these things. It's, it's the ancient language that we grew up with. We didn't evolve with the rest of the world because a small island set aside. So we, we go right back. So I just want to read this in the, in the original dialect, the way it should be read. Repeat with me. Ge, ge, imis, imis, chrisma, anointing, that means chrisma, ehede, you have, chrisma ehede, abo, to ayu ke idate panda from the holy one and you see all the idate ke idate you see you perceive panda all you just read some new testament greek you want to do the greek testament greek we run it it's all greek to me you're welcome to subscribe to it god bless you a little plug there amen so having anointing gives us a vision having anointing gives us understanding because Isaiah himself, which is such amazing, the prophecy of Isaiah, which found they found the book of Isaiah fully intact by the Dead Sea, when they were questioning whether it was a two, two books, whether it was legitimate, whether certain passages were in it or not, they actually found it by the Dead Sea. You do more research yourself. There's not time enough today to go through all the history and so forth. But when I was doing my, my dissertation for my doctorate, I was doing the Messianic concept for the scriptures and I was researching a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's amazing the things we discover historically that validate the word of God. But anyway, that's a different story for a different time. It says this. So, so, so uh, Isaiah is amazing because in the book of Isaiah, the, prophet, the prophecies of Isaiah, when we have 61 which speaks about the anointing, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But, he, but in Isaiah chapter 11, it speaks about the tributes of the anointing. I wish I'm speaking to someone. And the evidence of having the anointing. See, because if you have the anointing and the way you, the way you speak and behave will betray you. That is the evidence, that is, that is the proof of whether the anointing is upon you by your behavior, by your outlook, by your reactions and not your responses, praise God. So in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 following tells us the attributes, the characteristics of the anointing, of having the anointing of the Lord upon your life. And I want to just go through these for a few moments and we're going to finish very shortly, praise God. How long have I been speaking for? I don't keep track of the time I've been speaking for, I'm not sure. Can you just give me a benchmark? 40 minutes, so I pray that uh, I try and round you off not too long. I don't want to, I don't want to overfeed you and give you spiritual indigestion. But uh, let, let's, let's look at Isaiah chapter 11. There should come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch should grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord should rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he should not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he should judge the poor, and decide with equity 
for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness should be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also should dwell with, should dwell with the lamb. The leopard will, should lie down with the young girl. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a, and a little child should lead them. The cow and the bear should graze, the young ones should lie down together, and the lion should eat straw like the ox. The nursing child should play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child should put his hand in the viper's den. They should not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth should be filled of the knowledge of the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's a powerful, powerful statement that is made here of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, there should be a rod of Jesse, who should, should stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles should seek him, and his resting place should be glorious. There's so many different aspects, so many different layers, so many different facets to this prophetic declaration in chapter 11. These few verses from verse 1 to verse 10, it's a powerful, there's powerful imagery here that really is enriching. I can preach on every verse for hours and hours, and I don't think you want me to do this this morning. So I just want to give a little overview very quickly of what's happening here. They, 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 they give the Holy Spirit seven attributes, if you like. Uh, they speak about the Spirit of the Lord, then they, they identify the seven aspects or attributes or functions or manifestations of, the, of receiving the Holy Spirit. And I want just to name a, a number of them just to say the important thing here about the anointing. It says, the Spirit of the Lord should rest upon him. Well, the Spirit of the Lord embodies all these attributes. But it says the Spirit of wisdom. When you have the Holy Spirit, you're wise. But not wise in relation to worldly things. The wisdom of God is foolishness to the world. So when you act in the wisdom of God, you may look like a fool to people around you. Because you may do things that are not conventional to the world, that seem unreasonable to the world, but they're reasonable in God. Ah. It says, do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Being transformed, changing the way you behave, the way you speak, the way you see. The people not, might not think it's natural to them, but it's spiritual, it's supernatural to God. Because he goes on, to, as this unfolds, to speak about the attributes of what this brings about, the, the Spirit of the Lord, what it brings about in somebody's life. It speaks about understanding. It speaks about knowledge. See, if you just have one thing isolated on its own, you need to have an understanding with knowledge. Because information is one thing, but understanding how to apply that information is what gives you power. If you have a screwdriver, no one's seen a screwdriver, somewhere primitive, no one's actually seen an actual screwdriver, they will not know its function. But if you give them an understanding how to use it, they can benefit from that tool. It's the same thing with other things in life. We may have a certain things, we may have certain information, but if you don't know the context and how to apply it, it's useless to us. I wish I'm speaking to someone. You know, so it's, it's putting understanding to the knowledge empowers you, praise the Lord. You can quote a scripture, but you need to know how to quote the, quote, quote the scripture and the context in, in to quote the scripture. It's not just about quoting scripture. It's knowing the power. What, why are you quoting that scripture and what's the benefits of that scripture? It's like praying in tongues. We, we may hear someone and we might mimic tongues. It's one thing to mimic tongues. It is something different to be in the spirit speaking in angelic languages and spiritual languages. It's two different things. The devil can mimic tongues, but it doesn't know the power and implication of what is actually being said. It's doing it in a context that makes the difference. And it's the Holy Spirit that puts our, our lives in a context that we can be empowered to be all that God wants us to be, praise God. And, and if we're not in that context, we're going to be like those who John identifies. They were with them, but they were there, but they were not of them because they left, because they didn't have the sustaining power to endure, because the Holy Spirit is what gives us the strength to overcome in the face of adversity. I wish I, I'm speaking to someone, Praise God. And then he says, we're speaking about the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, things begin to change. Our judgment is not judged on emotion. As he says here, he says that, that we, you know, when we judge, we judge righteously. Oh, because oftentimes we judge from where we're prejudiced and we discriminate. We judge from a, a, a disadvantaged position. 
Because if, when you're judging something for an emotion, you're not being rational because you're, you're being blind. There's a blind side to things because there's something called blind loyalty. You always lean towards what you are, what you, what you, your, your, your reference, your, what you, what you, what you, what's familiar to you. And you always, and whether it's just or not, you want to support what you feel is, is close to you emotionally. Ah. Oh. Again, these are all subjects that take hours to, to decode, to explain, and so forth. But I just want to say to you is that when we, when we do make judgments, we have to judge in a righteous way. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 24, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Be informed. Don't make a decision. Be informed. Otherwise, you'll be misguided and you make the wrong decisions. And you make, you, you, in trying to be just, you become unjust. Because you're doing it from an emotion, not from a, a real impartial place. And whatever we do, must, we must be impartial with everything that we are doing, praise God. And then he goes on, Isaiah chapter 11 goes on to say to us, speaks about, goes from the divine attributes, the rational attributes, and starts speaking about the animal kingdom, about, about the irrational uh, aspect of creation, which is the animal kingdom. And I want to qualify this very quickly, and I'm going to finish very shortly. He says this, he goes on to, he begins this, he says, verse 5, I go from verse 5, Isaiah 11, verse 5 says this, the wolf also should dwell with the lamb, the leopard should lie down with the young, no, let me go to verse 5, righteousness should be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Then he says this, verse 5, verse 6, the wolf also should dwell with the lamb. The leopard should lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child should lead them. What is it all about coming from divinity, rationality to irrationality? What is he actually saying here? He's saying when the Holy Spirit comes, men's mindsets will change. Ah, oh. Because these animals are not just per se a representation of the animal kingdom. They are a representation of different attitudes of people. When the anointing comes, it will change people's attitudes. Oh. The anointing will change, will have an impact in people's minds. So those who have the wolf mind will change, will be able to cohabit with the lamb. Before Jesus great gave warning against to beware of wolves coming in sheep's clothing. But when the anointing comes, the power of the Holy Spirit will arrest will restrain the wolf and change the, the, the internal nature and attitude of the wolf to cohabit with the lamb, praise God. And, it, and all these animals are a depiction of the different nations, the foreign nations that were against Israel. And when he said when the anointing comes, the whole world will come under the covering and the kingship of God Almighty. I wish I was speaking to someone. And that's why the Lord was oftentimes warning the church against uh, False prophets, wolves, warning them against, he says, he warns them against the dogs. He says, do not throw, do not give bread to the dogs and do not throw what's holy. He says, do not throw pearls under swine and do not give what's holy to the dogs. He wasn't speaking about the swine. He wasn't speaking about the physical dog, the animal realm. He was speaking about attitudes of people. The dogs were a representation of, of, of the Gentiles and the swine were unclean because in the Jewish uh, dietary law, it was forbidden to, to shepherd or eat swine. And they were unclean. It was any nation that didn't come under the cleansiness and pure and sanctification of God. So be careful. Don't throw, don't give truth to people who will just tread it underfoot. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. And that's why Jesus said to the, Can Can the, the Canaanite woman, the Phoenician Greek Canaanite woman, he said to her, the bread is not for the little dogs, meaning for the Gentiles. In fact, in, in Psalm 22, we, we, when we read about what it said, tells us, Psalm 22 tells us about the dogs have surrounded me. He says, let me just qualify, balls of bush, and then he says, the dogs are talking about the animal kingdom here. He's not speaking about the animal kingdom. He's speaking about people's, people's attitudes and behavior. Because without the Holy Spirit, this is how we behave, like the animal kingdom. I wish I'm speaking to someone. Without knowledge, without understanding, without wisdom, that's how people behave. When we see the atrocious things that happen on our streets today, 
Even the protesters are using unrighteous ways to talk about righteousness, which we shouldn't be that way. We should let the righteous, we should be righteous in everything. That's why Martin Luther the King behaved in that particular way because he wanted light to disperse darkness, not darkness to disperse darkness, not hatred to disperse, but love to disperse darkness. That's why Gandhi was peaceful demonstrating. Oh. Otherwise, what makes us different? If then we're fighting fisticuffs with each other, when we come in, who's going to know who is the righteous and who is the unrighteous? He says, do not argue with a fool. Because if you argue with a fool, no one, someone coming to buy will look at you both. And he's not going to know which one is the fool. We're, we're, are we going to stand out different? We've got to let our light shine in the midst of darkness. And if we let God take control, all things are possible unto them who believe, praise God. That's why in Psalm 22, verse 12, it says this. Many bulls have surrounded me. This is the Jewish nation. The bulls were the clean animals. They have so strong bulls of Bashan. Having so the fatted uh, Pharisees uh, and the fatted uh, Levites were around him, watching, rejoicing, delighting in his in his in his crucifixion. That's the that's the, the people. But then he goes on to say, verse sixteen: For dogs have surrounded me. So he compares. We have the comparison of the bulls of Bashan. He says the the. Strong bulls of Basha have surrounded and circled me. And then he goes to speak about the dogs have surrounded me. The dogs were a symbol of the Gentiles. It was the Gentiles who put them on. The congregation of the wicked have enclo has enclosed me. They, have, they pierce my hands. and my, It's the Gentiles who pierce his hands and the feet. It was not the, the bulls of Basha and the Jewish people. Ah, oh, hallelujah. So when he speaks about these animals later on cohabiting, he's speaking about. What will happen at the end when he'll bring all people, all nations together, they'll worship God, come under him and worship, all nations are going to gather. All the dietary law that spoke about the different characteristics of different nations, they will all come together. That's why when Peter had his dream, when he was hungry, he fell into a trance and he saw, he saw a sheep coming down from heaven, praise God, hallelujah, in Acts chapter 10 verse, verse 10. And in that, in that sheet, there was all type of animals in there, unclean animals. And God says to kill and eat. And he said, Am I, nothing unclean has ever passed my lips. He said, he said, God says, what I've made clean, do not call unclean. And he was speaking about Cornelius and the Gentiles coming in to the commonwealth of Israel, praise God. And that's what he's speaking about. As I says, when 19 comes, people will change. Your enemy will become your friend. Let me tell you something. Your hater will become your supporter. And let me tell you, if you act in accordance, if not, not always, you will always have haters. But more than not, we need to trust God and look for the best, not for the worst. We look for the worst and not for the best. We need to look for the best, not for the worst, worst praise God. They will come in unity together, praise God. And we will, we will impact their life. That's why Saul, who becomes Paul, was an enemy of the church. But when God is in the equation, things can change. Things can change. So we need to be indifferent. We need to be uh, impartial, I should say, to what's happening around. Because your friend today can be your enemy tomorrow. I wish I'm speaking to someone. And your enemy today can be your, your friend, co-worker tomorrow. You, there's no guarantees in life. I've seen people who are the best of friends. Now they're the worst of enemies. I've seen people who are the worst of enemies. Now they're the best of friends. You cannot carry, you cannot script these things. You just got to give it to God. Praise God. And this is why we're told in Acts, in Psalm chapter 22, verse 27, it says this. The same psalm that he speaks about the bulls of Bashan, the strong bulls of Bashan, and the dogs that surrounded him. Watch this. This is what it says here. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. This is Psalm 22, the crucifixion. At the end, God is going to have the last word. And all the families of the nation shall worship before you. We see in the book of Revelations, all nations, all tongues worship before God. You know, we have the last chapter, church. Victory, victory, victory. We have overcome we all, we, we, we have overcome and we are overcoming in Jesus' name. Praise God. Watch this. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. I pray you receive that. God bless you. It's been a wonderful time of fellowship. There's so much I can say with you. And we're looking ahead. We've got time scales of the 5th of July. That hopefully, God willing, all being well with the measures in place, that we'll gather together as a church. We'll let everyone know in good time. We're going to prepare everything for 
a celebration return of service that we'll all be gathered together so we'll not be in an empty room so apart from a few people here it's an empty room we're going to be celebrating together and we're going to be part of all these nations that come under the god of glory our lord and savior jesus christ be blessed let me pray with you with for this word that will go forth that the anointing will be upon your life that god will break every yoke that god will make a way where there's no way that god will transform beginning with us and the people around, that you'll be a blessing to people, that you'll be the cause of people seeing for the first time, that you'll be the cause of people hearing for the first time, that you'll be the cause of people having peace and being enriched through the word of God for the first time, that you'll be the cause of people coming out of their prisons, coming out of oppression for the first time. Let the Lord's blessing flow through you and flow out through you and out of you and touch the people around you, your families, your friends, your neighbours, your work colleagues, your, wherever you are, you'll make the difference. Let that light shine that the song says, this little light of mine is going to shine, praise God. Let it shine, let it shine. Father, bless every person at the end of my voice this morning. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Even when we're not faithful, you are faithful. Bless, I pray, if anyone is suffering from any ailment, and physical ailment, pray you bring a healing. I pray if anyone is suffering from any financial restraints, I pray you provide their resource, their needs that they have in Jesus' name. If anyone is being disheartened, I pray you encourage now. If anyone is hopeless, give them the hope of, to move forward. If anyone is faithless, increase their faith now by hearing your word and encouraging them now. I pray that they'll grow in your name, in your word, Lord, that they'll grow, be transformed, Lord. And the lion, the wolf will co-inhabit with the lamb. Lord, that whatever's happening around us, change is happening. And as we come through this, this, this tunnel, that we are the light in this tunnel, we'll see people transform. We'll see great revival as we've not seen it for centuries, for time, that we see transformation in people's life. Bless everyone who's watching this program now. With no exception, you are blessed. You are included, not excluded. God is a God of inclusion, not a God of exclusion. He includes everyone. It doesn't matter what nation, what nationality, what status you are. God is blessing you now at the end of my voice. Hallelujah. God loves all people. We are all one people under God in Jesus' name. I want to thank the Lord for the health services who work tirelessly, for the emergency services. Bless them. I want to thank the Lord for the royal family in this country, for all the dignitaries in this country. Bless them, Lord. Keep them well. I pray for the government of this country. Lord, give them the wisdom, Lord, and the understanding and the knowledge how to navigate forward to come through this stronger and better for it in Jesus' precious name. I pray for the people of Sabbath bereavement. I thank you for Dr. Gosler's life, for my auntie's life, Katerina, for my neighbor's life, Joy, as they've come to be with you, Lord. They're in your loving embrace. And I pray for anyone else who's Sabbath bereavement, that God will console you, God will comfort you, God will encourage you, and God will show you this is not an end, but it's until we meet again. It's a comma, not a full stop. We'll all be together in the glorious resurrection. We give the Lord the praise, the glory, and the worship, the preeminence. And the church and the people at home will say a resounding amen. And before you finish prayer, I want you to put your hand on your heart and say, Lord, I pray, bless me, protect me, put a hedge around me, that I'll be a blessing unto others. And put your hand on your head and say, Lord, I pray for your anointing to come upon me in a new way today, a fresh way today. That I will look for your eyes. That I will look for it in a different way, Lord. That I'll be an encouragement. I'll be a hope to my family, to my friends, to my neighbours. As I seek to serve you, Lord. I give you the praise, the glory and the privilege. I say this in Jesus' name. We say amen, amen, amen. And will you lift up your hand and say thank you, Lord, for what you have done, what you are doing and what you will do. Because you are still enthroned and you're still in control. We give you the praise, the glory and the worship. Together we say resounding amen. Amen, amen. God bless you. We're going to have our time of offering. And uh, as, oh, sorry, not the time of, the time of communion. That's already gone and done. But this is another offering. This is the Lord's offering to us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you have your cup and your bread at home, with your family, or if you're on your own, just celebrate with us. And I thank God that we can do this in this way. This is amazing. We can use this technology to come in communion, united together. We take from one bread, one cup, praise God. And just lift it up and lift yourself to the Lord, praise God. 
And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broken, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it, this is my body. We take your bread. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim to the Lord's death, the Lord's death till he comes. You are loved and you're highly favoured. My sense and my encouragement, as I said on Friday during the week as I was praying, was to come back to our spiritual centre, look at every situation for the eyes of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And we can overcome what we have overcome. So God bless you where you are in your homes until next Friday. And as I remind you, on Fridays, the service is at 7.30. And I want to delve deeper into Bible study and take it or notch up maybe next Friday. So be prepared, have your notebooks ready. And always the good thing is that it goes, the messages go in the archives. So you can go and watch them again afterwards and take your notes and read and look at it yourself and have that relationship with God in his word. It's really important. I cannot emphasize the importance of joining in that it helps us grow internally and helps us with every situation in life, strengthen us. And when we're strengthened, we can be a strength to other people. When our shoulders are lifted up and we've got that confidence, not that arrogance and conceitedness, but that confidence in the spirit, we can be a help to other people, an encouragement to other people at any time, not just this time, any time. So God bless you as I'm going to invite Shenis and Dominic. Is it together? They're going to join me back here. They're going to close with a worship. It's a blessing to have Shenis with us as well. What a lovely duet today with Dom, Deacon Dom. God bless you. And, uh, you know, um, it's, it's good to celebrate in the house all the time. Praise the Lord. Inspiring word from our special this morning. We want to thank God for his life. Amen. As we close the service, we're going to lift up one more worship song. Amen. It's called Love on the Line.
rescued my soul. He's the one who has welcomed me home and he is truly the savior of all and we sing forever. We just want to give him the thanks and the praise this morning as we close our service. Hallelujah. We just thank you Lord for these words Lord, today Lord God. We thank you for the anointing of God that breaks every yoke Lord God. We just thank you for that word that's going to empower Lord God. May we embrace that word. May we um, internalize it Lord God. May, may it be May it become a real part of us, Lord God, in our everyday walks, Lord God, that as we leave church, Lord God, and we go out into the world, that people will see the difference within our lives, Lord God, and we want to inquire and we want to know more about you, Lord God. We give you the thanks and the praise, God. We lift up Archbishop's uh, life, Lord God. We ask that you just bless him, cover him, Lord God. As he's given out that word today, Lord God, we pray, Lord, that more of your notes will be upon him, Lord God, that he will give out more and more of you, Lord God, to impact the nation, Lord God. We thank you for his life, for his commitment, for his example, Lord God. We ask that you just continue to add on to him, Lord God, as he serves your purpose, Lord God. And we want to thank you for our senior pastor, also, Lord God, who's, who's lived up worship with us this morning. We ask that you just strengthen her, Lord God, encourage her, Lord God, bless her, Lord God, and everything that she says and does, Lord God, to, to encourage your people, Lord God, that, that her life will, will continue to be enriched, Lord God, in you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for every brother and sister within our church, Lord God, for our leadership, Lord God, for every area of responsibility within our church, Lord God. Father God, we ask, Lord, that your hand be upon it, sanctifying it, and blessing it, Lord God, to, to, to extend us and stretch us, Lord God, to do more for you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, once again, for the anointing. And we just ask, Lord, that, that Father God, there'll be more of you within us, Lord God, and less of us this morning, as we give you the praise, the glory, and the worship. Let's say that the grace giver, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with each one of us now and forevermore. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. God bless you. Until we meet again on Friday at 7.30, like Archbishop said, be blessed. <laughs>